Hey, Internet, it's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, so whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today, no exception, it is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings segments. Today we're going to be talking about the Barrow Downs and its history. Uh, so, if you are familiar with Lord of the Rings through the movies, you may not be familiar with the Barrow Downs. Is that uh, is in the in the books, specifically in Fellowship of the Ring, uh, but it did not translate into the movies. And I think I know why. So, uh, we'll set that first. So, uh, I'm sure Peter Jackson had to have thought about including the Barrow Downs, at least temporarily, because it's actually a very cinematic scene. It's creepy, there's like a horror element to it, it can be kind of right up his alley, um, a little air of danger. Um, however, the situation is resolved by Tom Bombadil. I did a video about Tom Bombadil, uh, you can check that out. But I think since Peter Jackson made the decision, you know what, Tom Bombadil doesn't show up in the last, you know, <laughs> two books, much less the last two thirds of the first book. Let's cut, let's cut him as a character, hence we'll cut this scene. So I think because of Tom Bombadil, this scene uh, was removed. As I say, though, would have been cool to see. Um, so let me uh, just recap what happens in the Barrow Downs first, and then I'll give you the history of it, and I'll show you how it uh, impacts the Lord of the Rings. Okay. So, in Fellowship of the Ring, Barrow Downs scene takes place while our four hobbits, Frodo, Sam, Merry, Pippin, on their way to Bree. Right? They, they think they're meeting with Gandalf. Turns out they end up meeting with Aragorn. But on their way, they uh, go through the old forest. They meet up with Tom Bombadil. They stay at his house. And they have now left Tom Bombadil's uh, company. He does give them, uh, he says, hey, if you're ever in trouble and you're in this area, here's a rhyme you can, you can chant, you can sing, and I will come to your aid. So he teaches that to Frodo and company. Okay, so they set out. He gives them a warning. Hey, by the way, watch out for the Barrow Downs. You don't want to get trapped there, uh, particularly after dark. Not a good idea. Um, they don't really heed his warning, or they get turned around, but basically they don't heed his warning. It's interesting, actually, uh, my wife noted when I was discussing with her the potential topic for this week's video, she noted that that sounded a lot like uh, The Hobbit uh, in which Gandalf tells the uh, the company of dwarves and, and Bilbo, hey, stay on the path, stay on the path, uh, when they're walking through Mirkwood. And, of course, they drift off the path, and the denizens of Mirkwood cause a lot of problems for them. Well, same thing here. They kind of <laughs> veer off the path a bit, and the denizens of the Barrow Downs cause problems for Frodo and company. Okay, so um, what the, uh, a Barrow Down is... Uh, you know, a down is a hill, a barrow is uh, a grave, essentially. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but typically it's a grave. And they're very common in, in real life, right? So even back to prehistoric times, you'll find barrow downs. They're basically graves dug into hillsides. Um, and so that's where uh, our party ventures into. I'll describe a little bit more about the barrow downs because it's not just totally a graveyard. But at this point in, in its history, it kind of is. So they wander into a giant graveyard, essentially. Um, what they encounter is a Barrow White. It's a spirit. And this Barrow White essentially charms them, casts a spell on them, lures them into the Barrow Mound, and is going to sacrifice them, I believe, just you know, to take their souls, essentially. So... Uh, what happens is Frodo is the first to wake up, and he, he's like, oh, and he finds himself just inside this underground, you know, uh, structure. Uh, looks around, he sees his three companions all laying out on the on the floor of this, uh, you know, this barrow, um, uh, pale and unconscious. And then he sees, like, you know, because a, a typical barrow mound is not just one big room; it's a series of rooms. 
And so from around the corner, where this, you know, this barrow uh, like almost has a hallway, essentially, veers off. From around the corner, this large arm comes, a, comes you know, into the room, and he describes the fingers walking towards Sam, who is the closest body. And it's reaching for the hilt on Sam's sword. It, basically, the intent is it's going to kill Sam. So Frodo uh, gets his wits about him, takes, finds a sword uh, in the uh, uh, in the barrel mount, and he cuts off our uh, White's hand, and then he sings the song. He says the rhyme that brings Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil shows up, chases away the barrel White, and the party is saved, and they continue on to Bree. Okay, so. Um, that's essentially what happens in the story. Um, I would, I would posit, perhaps the reason Frodo wakes up before anyone else is perhaps because he has the ring, and I would think maybe the ring would, since it's, it would be, I think it would help him resist perhaps some of these other uh, evil spirits because you know if he if he were to even put the ring on, this spirit would probably obey him. Um, so perhaps it gave him a little more uh, ability to. Uh, be conscious in this moment, other than, you know, otherwise he would be uh, quite dead. Um, so, um, a couple of things, though, interestingly about that, too. Um, when they wake up, you know, so Tom has chased everything off, they wake up, Mary, specifically, Mary Adok Brindybuck, um, wakes up, but he has um, a recall. Like, he uh, he's still in, like, a dream state, and he is he is imagining being killed. Uh, he describes, he's like, oh, and we're on the field, and I'm stabbed to the heart. Ah, and he's feeling the pain of that moment. And in one of the appendices, uh, it is, it, Tolkien hints at the fact that this particular barrel mound may have indeed be, uh, been uh, the burial place of the last prince of that region who had died uh, fighting like, actually against the witch king of Angmar, which is very important. I'll bring that up in a second. In any case, so it seems like Mary had taken in the dying moments of the person who was buried in this tomb. Uh, and he, he eventually gets to his senses. They essentially uh, rob the tomb. They take weapons. Um, and uh, notably, it's that... I'll, this kind of comes into play, too, which is really cool. Uh, but Mary the, takes a dagger from this particular barrel mound. So it's one of the ones that the, the Dunedain and this prince had used in, the, in, in combat. And uh, that's the dagger that he ends up attacking the Witch King with at the end when he stabs the Witch King in the heel, distracts the Witch King long enough for Eowyn to finish the job and kill off the Witch King. Uh, that dagger is the one that he got here in this barrel mound. Okay, so... Um, that is essentially what happens in the book. Um, here's a little bit about the the background of this. For one thing, it's really interesting because the barrel mounds are or downs are so close to the Shire, right? So the, all this is basically happening in the region of the Shire and has such a rich history. Uh, you know, sometimes you just think of like, oh, the Shire, that's where the, the hobbits hang out, and it always has been that way. But, and it, and it kind of has, but not really, right? There's a, there's a lot was going on in this area that's not particularly covered in The Lord of the Rings. One thing I'll even mention is, you know, the fact that the hobbits build their houses into the sides of hills, that's very much like a barrow down. Like, they have their own version of barrows, essentially, that the, the hobbits, so maybe they even took over that uh, practice from the people that uh, lived nearby. Who knows? Anyway, anyway so um, we go back. The Barrow Downs were inhabited by humans all the way back into the First Age. Uh, I, I always bring this up that, you know, the War of the Rings at the end of the Third Age, which is about 3,000 years long. Then there, before that's the Second Age, which is a few thousand years. Before that's the First Age. So this is several thousand years earlier. Um, this, the Barrel Downs were a, a, a kind of a thriving community. And when I say also Downs, that means that there's things like, you know, like Stonehenge, right? There are stones, stone outcroppings atop these things. Uh, it would be very creepy 
in uh, <laughs> once abandoned, but in its heyday, it would have been like a pretty thriving area. And this is where the original first age humans buried their kings and heroes. In the second age, when the Numenorians came over, uh, first just to settle and then later because their island was destroyed and they had nowhere else to go, uh, this was the first place they came actually, the Barrow Downs. And I'm gonna guess this is the, the reason they came here first, this was like Elendil, right? So this is ancestor of Aragorn was here in this spot on the Barrow Downs. And I, I would guess the reason is because the, it had such a sacred feel to it, right? This is where these ancient kings were buried and it probably held a lot of significance for the Numenorians. So they set up kingdom here. Uh, this is basically the kingdom of Arnor. And it's ruled over for uh, several years until finally the king of Arnor uh, Yarendur dies. This is in, I won't throw too many dates at you, I'll try not to, but 861 of the Third Age. So you're still talking, you know, over 2,000 years before the War of the Ring. Uh, Yarendur dies. Okay. He's got, uh, his sons basically start fighting about who should be the rightful heir. And so Arnor splits into three kingdoms at that point. Um, so Arnor is kind of no more. <laughs> no more Arnor. Uh, there's there's Arthodyne and Cardolan and Redire. Um, and those are the three different areas. Now, interestingly, too, because again, in the region of the Barrow Downs is Weathertop. Weathertop is in the movies. Uh, that's where uh, Aragorn fights off the Nazgul. Uh, it's where uh, Frodo is stabbed by the Nine and, you know, almost dies. Um, Weathertop had been, at, back in this time, a very uh, strategic place. It was, it was one of the highest points in the area, and they had a watchtower, the Watchtower of Amansul. And uh, Amansul had a, a plantier. So one of those seeing stones was right here, and they use it to communicate with, uh, you know, other towers. So um, that particular weather top and the tower and the plantier were all basically at a point where all three of these kingdoms met. So kind of right on the dividing line between these, these three kingdoms where the, they, were, they were a bit at odds. And each of those kingdoms wanted that tower and that plantier. That was a very strategic thing to hold. And so that was a real source of strife between these uh, these princes uh, for a long time. Um, in any case, uh, time goes on, there's some bickering, and eventually the witch king of Angmar decides, you know, I think this place is ripe for the picking. I'm going to attack the former Arnor and try to take over uh, this area. So he he attacks and uh, does quite well. Within about a hundred years, so he attacks in like 1300. By 1409, he's taken out two of the three uh, kingdoms the form of former Arnor. So Cardolan and Redire are done in. Um, the, the barrow in which I was describing where Mary has this flashback image of a prince dying the prince that died would be the last prince of Cardolan. And he apparently got stabbed in combat by one of the witch king's uh, you know, soldiers. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, that's in 1409. Weathertop is burned to the ground. The witch king just burns it. Um, and the, the, the planter that was at Weathertop is rescued, the Dunedain take it before the weather top is destroyed and take it off to the capital city of the Arthodyne. It was, it, was, it was a very important city even in Arnor itself back when Arnor was still a thing. It's the city of uh, Fornost. Now Fornost, again, it's very close to the Shire. It's just north of the Shire and um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, northeast maybe, but whatever. Um, the book, the Lord of the Rings, they don't, they don't go there. They walk 
near it, but don't go past it. Um, but it was a hugely important place, uh, you know, a thousand years earlier. So anyway, Thornost is kind of like the last holdout in a way from the Witch King. Arth the Arthodyne is the last of these three uh, realms still fighting against the Witch King. Um, so what happens is a couple hundred years go by. They're still holding out. Still, you know, everything's kind of at bay. Seems like status quo is has been achieved. But there is a great plague. 1636 of the Third Age, a plague sweeps in and just decimates folks. Now, obviously, Tolkien got this idea from the great plague that swept through Europe. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very similar model. So the, the Black Death. Um, you know, the Black Death wiped out anywhere between a third and a half of all the, the population of Europe. Similarly, that's what this does. Some, uh, some regions, literally half their population is, is killed off. So the plague, uh, you know, like there's the town uh, of Osgiliath. I don't know if you remember that from the movies. Uh, that is on the river there. It's where Faramir is trying to hold Osgiliath. Uh, and he's kind of hanging out in the ruins. It used to be a buffer between Mordor and Minas Tirith. Well, the reason that it's in all in ruins when, uh, you know, their uh, farmer is trying to guard it, part of the reason is because this plague came through, killed everybody, and they didn't really bother to come back that much. There was a, a half-hearted effort to, to reclaim that land, but there were so few people, so few people left to, to try to make a city out of it. It just didn't work out. So anyway, it was, it was, a, it was a horrible deal. Um, and the Great Plague comes through. And in the wake of the Great Plague, the Witch King starts uh, sending in the Barrow Whites. It's the Witch King creates the Barrow Whites. Um, and he has sorcerers under him that uh, aid him in this process as well. But and just in case you've forgotten, the Witch King of Angmar is one of the nine, right? He's the leader of the Nazgo, the, the nine Black Riders. He's the, the one that Eowyn kills uh, in the Battle of Pelennor Fields, but he's, he's there all throughout. Okay. In any case, so he created these Barrow Whites. These are the same Barrow Whites that attempt to kill Frodo and company, you know, a thousand years later. The idea of the Barrow Whites is, is not that he, uh, he being the Witch King, let's say, took a corpse of a, of a dead Dúnedain king and turned it into a Barrow White. I think the idea is these are spirits, uh, perhaps of people that died in the plague. However, however, he found these spirits and captured them. And then those spirits enter the bodies of these former kings and such. Uh, and so it is, you know, it's not that they're, it's the Prince of Cardolan is a barrel white. It's the, he has the husk, but inside is this malevolent spirit. I think is the way that works. It's a little, little ambiguous, but that seems to be, uh, generally speaking, how that, how uh, this magic works, this necromancy of sorts. So, um, the reason that he, being the Witch King, sends the Barrow Whites into the Barrow Downs, is basically to make it uh, unattractive for the Dúnedain to retake. Right, the plague killed off a bunch of folks. They'd already lost a lot of uh, men in that area, and they were they wanted to come back there. It is, as I say, it's a sacred place. It's a place they wanted to reclaim, but now the place became very dangerous because it's, all these Barrow Whites are there. Barrow Whites are also uh, much like trolls. They, uh, sunlight kills them off, so they have to stay, you know, to nighttime. And also, obviously, the barrows are underground. So as long as they're underground, that's a really a convenient place for them to hide out. Um, and so that's why they can reside in these barrows uh, because it is uh, sunlight free. Um, so, um, so yeah, so the these barrow whites have been sent by the Witch King. Uh, they do their job, obviously, <laughs> because over a, a thousand years later, they're still haunting this place that is now desolate and no one has lived there in over a thousand years. So mission accomplished in that way. Um, so now, Arthodyne, after this plague, 
it's in real trouble. The, the, the people, the Dunedain that live in that area are, are few and far between, and the Witch King takes the opportunity to attack and basically destroys uh, Arthodyne. Now, the king of Arthodyne at the time was Arvedui. And Arvedui is living in Farnost, uh, this big, this town, um, and that's, it gets destroyed. He had, he being Arvedui, had uh, two of the Palantirs. Uh, one was from Amonsul, and he had another one. That when that tower was destroyed, they basically brought him two Palantirs to hang on to because they were so valuable. So he is forced to flee the city of Fornost ahead of the Witch King uh, with the Palantir. He, uh, he goes up north. There's a long story there that, anyway, he meets up with a group of people called the Lossoth, also known as the Snowmen. Uh, and they, uh, they hide him for a while. And so he hides out, he and his men. Uh, at some point, they decide to take a ship, even though the Snowmen tell them, you know, it's a, kind of a bad idea. It's really uh, wintry out there and uh, bad sailing. They, uh, he decides to risk it. The boat sinks, is capsized in icy waters. He drowns, and the Palantiri, the two Palantir, are, are drowned as well, are lost forever in the sea. So uh, that happens shortly after the fall of Fornost, shortly after the death of our Vedui. So basically, with all this happened within a year, there is the Battle of Fornost. And this is where humanity rallies under a new ruler, Yarnur. And Yarnur leads a, a, a successful campaign against the Witch King, retakes Fornost. The Witch King flees, uh, flees east, and as he's fleeing, actually Glorfindel, who's an elf, a heroic elf who's done a lot of stuff, he didn't show up so much in the movies, but he was actually the elf that met Frodo at the Fort of Rivendell. You know, they in the movies they have... Uh, Arwen there. Uh, that was actually Glorfindel in the books, but whatever. In any case, Glorfindel leads a, a, an army of elves, ostensibly from Rivendell, uh, wipes out all of Witch King's forces. Somehow the Witch King manages to escape and retreat back, e continue east to Angmar. Yarnur wants to follow the Witch King, to kill him off, and this is where the prophecy comes in. Glorfindel is the one who tells uh, our friend Yarnir the prophecy, which is, uh, not by the hand of men shall he fall. Right? We know that it turns it to a woman, Eowyn, who ends up killing him. But it's Glorfindel who gives that prophecy. Um, Yarnir uh, relents. Um, and uh, so what ends up happening is, Witch King goes back, gathers his forces again, but for several years, he's kind of out of commission. Uh, shortly after the Battle of Fornost, uh, Yarnur becomes the king of Gondor. Um, and he uh, <laughs> he's called out by the witch. The witch king is kind of like, come at me. <laughs> come at me, bro. Um, you know, challenges Yarnur, who has a big ego and is kind of a quick temper. Um, and... Uh, this is from, um, you know, he's, since he's the king of Gondor, he's ruling down in Minas Tirith. Uh, the stewards of Gondor, who are at that point his advisors, advise him, hey, don't fall for this. Don't go, you know, the witch king can't do anything anyway. Don't don't go chasing this guy. Uh, he, that's, you're just playing right into his hands. So Yarner listens to his counsel and does not take the bait. Uh, seven years later, however, this is 2050, of the Third Age, so a little less than a thousand years before the War of the Ring, the Witch King makes another challenge. Come on, you. I dare you to come fight me. Yarnir does not get counsel this time, and his ego gets the better of him. I don't know. He sets out with a small group to go face the Witch King in Angmar and is never seen again. We can assume he just basically got slaughtered. Because he went right into the lion's den, and the witch king didn't necessarily have a whole lot of honor, so uh, uh, bad times 
for Yarnir. And that is what sets off, that's when the stewards, you know, take over uh, again. And so that's all, the stewards are in place until um, our friend Aragorn comes back to reclaim the throne of Gondor. Uh, that's, what, that's what precipitates a lack of kingship for a thousand years. Um, in the case of uh, Arvedui's death, He's the one that drowned with the, the Palantir. Um, even though the Battle of Farnost kicked the Witch King out of Farnost, there were so few people still from the Great Plague and from the loss of forces in this battle, it was never rebuilt. Even up to the age of uh, the War of the Ring, if, if, let's say, Frodo and company had ventured a little bit farther to the north on their way to Bree, they would have just hit the ruins of Farnost. At the, the town was never rebuilt, never reestablished. Kind of a you know a real shame. But so the Dunedain instead, so the son, Arvedui's son, uh, started what essentially amounts to the Rangers. And so they are instead of hanging out in a big town, they are kind of nomadic at that point. And they're the Dunedain, and that's what Aragorn eventually uh, joins up with the Rangers. He goes. Right. I should mention one thing that I noted in the history. Um, in the Battle of Fornost, uh, there were a, a contingent of hobbit archers helped win the day. So the Shire sent hobbit archers for the Battle of Fornost. Also, interestingly, the Shire took a big hit from the plague as well. They were The plague affected them, killed off a, a large number of their population. Um, but I also thought that was kind of cool. That, so uh, the hobbits had archers, uh, and they helped win the day at the Battle of Fornost versus the Witch King. So, um, so interestingly, I thought this was kind of cool. So, Mary, I mentioned, had this vision. He was in the barrow. He was in the grave of this, the last prince of Cardolan who had been killed, struck down by the Witch King's forces. Um, so, you know, Mary had that sense memory of this king being struck down, so in some ways shared that that visceral moment with him. Took a, theoretically uh, the prince's dagger and used it to essentially kill the witch king. Now he didn't kill the witch king, but he assisted in the death of the witch king. And so in some ways it, it, it kind of came back around that these Dunedain uh, got their revenge through Mary. Uh, and and precipitated you know the downfall of the witch king eventually only took him another thousand plus years well in his case maybe three thousand plus years whatever took a while fifteen hundred years um, so um, I thought that was really cool uh, another thing I'll mention is that uh, you know the prophecy this you know but not by the hand of men uh, shall he fall uh, Tolkien admitted as much that he was very inspired by Shakespeare, who isn't. And so, you know, the prophecy of Macbeth was something that inspired this prophecy for the Witch King. And you can even make some parallels probably between the Witch King and Macbeth. Both were like ruled by greed and sold their soul. And Anyway, um, so, uh, so in the case of obviously in Macbeth, the prophecy was fulfilled when it was a, a man born through C-section killed Macbeth. Uh, in the case of Tolkien, he just kind of simplified it. It was like, it's a woman. That's fine. Um, so, but one thing I thought it was really interesting in this little tidbit is apparently Tolkien thought it was a kind of a cop-out uh, when Shakespeare gave, you know, part of the prophecy for Macbeth's death is, um, you know, when Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane. And the way that got resolved is the soldiers approaching the uh, uh, Duntonane, uh, you know, cut down some trees and use them as uh, camouflage. And Tolkien had really wanted to see trees, burn them wood. He wanted to see the trees animate and come to the castle. Like he was really looking forward to that and it didn't get it. And so uh, supposedly that is at least part of the inspiration for him creating the Ents. Because he wanted to, you know, he liked the idea of the woods animating and attacking, uh, say, a castle or something. And so uh, so instead of having people disguised as trees, he's like, no, I'm going to have animated trees. Damn it. Um, and so, yeah, so his, 
dissatisfaction with a, a particular portion of Macbeth led to Ents. thought that was kind of neat. Um, in any case, there you go. It's the Barrow Downs. It's a region right there, right next to the Shire. Uh, our heroes wander through it. It's got this really rich history, uh, and yet, um, you know, it's kind of a fleeting moment in there through it, but uh, I thought it was a, a worthy of inclusion in our video. So thank you so much for watching, and um, subscribe if you want to get further updates, and we'll be back with you soon. Bye, everybody.